1950s, um, and his chief ideologue, um, Anthony Crossland, who wrote this famous book called The Future of Socialism in 1956, which has become um, an abiding influence to um, members of the Labour Party, including some of its current leaders. What Crossland did was to say, look, socialism isn't about equality um, in, in absolute terms. Rather, socialism has to be, the socialism of the Labour Party has to be about equality of opportunity, not simple material equality, but equality of opportunity. And that this was primarily going to be achieved by giving people equal access to forms of social mobility. So for Crossland, education was a key, key mechanism for the achievement of um, educational um, opportunity. Um, it was, of course, in this time that the Labour Party is also repackaging itself in terms of its presentational skills, which we saw in the lecture a couple of weeks ago, or last week. When the Labour Party returns to power in 1964, it does so under Harold Wilson. And what Wilson does is promise to modernise the country. He basically embraces the Crossland Crosslandite ethos, and he says we're going to modernise the country by use of the white heat of technology, the new use of technology to modernise Britain's um, failing industrial base, um, and the expansion of education. Crossland becomes his education um, secretary, um, and he introduces a number of key um, uh, reforms, um, uh, not least of which was, which was the embrace of the, of the Robbins Report, which had come out in 1963, calling for a doubling of the number of university students uh, within a decade. Um, and indeed, this is achieved. In 1962, there have been 118,000 um, undergraduates, that's just 8% of the age group. By 1971, there were 457,000 undergraduates, which was about 14% of the population. But arguably, more critically, what Crossland does is to try and create a new form of secondary education. Remember that the 1944 Education Act had streamed people into these three schools by way of the 11 plus. Crossland gets rid of this and introduces is a new comprehensive school system that would try and build together all of the qualities of technical schools and grammar schools and the secondary modern school. Um, indeed, Crossland said that he wanted comprehensive schools to become grammar schools um, for all, and they were um, uh, um, educating 80%, 88% of school children by um, uh, 1980. Very important compromise here, though, was the failure to abolish private school, which was on the agenda for the Labour Party, but they shied away from it. So that's the first way in which the Labour Party tried to repackage themselves in the 1950s and the 1960s. Fast forward a decade when the Labour Party is again in the electoral wilderness after the election of Mrs Thatcher, and you have the same type of rethinking going on about how it is that the Labour Party can recapture the support of the working classes. And here, the key um, conduit for it was this magazine, which was actually um, the uh, magazine of the, uh, the British Communist Party, called Marxism Today. And in particular, the work of two intellectuals, Stuart Hall, um, a sociologist, and Martin Jack, a, um, a journalist. And they came up with an idea that Britain in the 1980s was living in what they described as new times which was effectively um, the transition to a new type of post-Fordist um, uh, uh, economy and the existence of globalisation and of identity politics. So I'll read you a brief quote from their key article. Mass production, the mass consumer, the big city, the big brother state, the sprawling hall, housing estate and the nation state are all in decline. Flexibility, diversity, differentiation, mobility, communication, decentralisation and internationalisation are in the incentives. In the process, our own identities, our own sense of self, our own subjectivities are being tra transformed. We are in a transition to a new era. And the Labour Party basically had to grapple with how to relaunch itself in this new era. And it did so over the course of a decade and a half under the leadership first of Neil Kinnock, that you heard doing his speech uh, against Mr Thatcher in 1983, then a man called John Smith, and then finally, and most importantly, with the election of Tony Blair as its leader in 1994, and the emergence or the rebranding of the Labour Party as the new Labour Party, which came to abandon its commitment to the nationalisation of, the, um, uh, the nationalization of, of industries. So here we have two examples of the Labour Party trying to respond to, these, um, uh, to the shifting sense of what had happened to the working class and uh, why it wasn't getting elected. Any questions before I move on to the, this last section? Yeah, no. Yeah, indeed. It's the 1983 election. The 1983 election, they have a leader called Michael Foote, who was on the left of the Labour Party, was one of the people who had founded the Keep Left movement in the 1950s against American, um, uh, against American influence and wanting to keep Britain on the line. He, he was a great admirer of Anaya and Bevan. Michael Foote and Neil Kinnock and Anaya and Bevan thought of themselves as a continuous part on the left of the Labour Party. And one of the reasons why um, the Labour Party's manifesto in 1983 was considered to be the longest suicide note in history was that um, it still embraced the nationalisation of industries and it was committed to nuclear disarmament, to unilateral nuclear disarmament, in the age, of course, of Reagan and Thatcher and the intensification of the Cold War against the Soviet, um, against the Soviet Union. In 1983, the Labour Party wanted to to undo all the reforms that Margaret Thatcher had done in, the, um, uh, in her first period of government. Good call, Malik. Malik, sorry. Still, it was a good call, even though I got your name wrong. Um, okay, let's move on to this last um, uh, uh, section, which is about culture and its role in rethinking and reassembling the working class. Now, the first thing I want to say here is there's a sort of paradox um, uh, that is taking place. There's a paradox in the sense that at the time that the working class is supposedly disappearing, it becomes increasingly culturally visible in the 1960s and the 1970s. And that increasing visibility is really about a certain set of cultural politics that take shape in that period to try and breathe new life into the traditional white working class. What I'm suggesting to you is that basically in the 1960s and the 1970s, the working class is remade culturally at the point when it seems to be disappearing socially, economically and politically. And you have to understand almost all of these cultural politics as a reaction against three key things. The rise of affluence, not the influence of Americanization, of American cultural life, and probably most importantly, uh, colonial migration and um, the, the populating of Britain with people of colour. All of these three elements, these people thought, were threatening the traditional working class. So the first cultural project that I'm going to talk about is fiction and the emergence of a new genre of novel known um, in the 1950s, characterised by or known as a literature that propagated a new type of figure, the angry young man. Um, the angry young man was a sort of composite figure. 
a composite figure that expressed the sort of dislocation of young working class people in a world of upward social mobility. They were caught between two worlds, neither the world of the old working class of the 1920s and the 1930s, nor of the new affluent um, uh, families of the 50s and the 60s. And they were reacting against the confines bo of both culture. They were reacting against the confines of their working class families, who expected them to behave in particular types of ways, and of their continuing exclusion from what they saw as uh, the growing world of middle class privilege. And they also felt that they had missed the boat politically. In the words of Jimmy Porter, the main character in um, John Osborne's Look Back in Anger, which was a play in 1956, he said, there are no good causes left. So these people are at sea, this angry young, these angry young men. The key novels um, that you um, should read if you like this type of stuff is Colin Wilson's The Outsider, which is a sort of horrible British version of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, a sort of embrace of existentialism in, the, in, in, a, in a rather um, uh, unfortunate way. Um, at Brain's uh, Room at the Top, it comes out in 1957, and my own personal favourite, um, Alan Sinatow's Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, which comes out in 1958. All of these novels become uh, uh, hugely popular and are made into films. And I'm going to show you a clip because I adore this movie. This is of Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, the trailer, uh, the trailer for it. It's a brilliant movie. It's a brilliant novel. This is the Take a good look at this face. Remember this name. You'll remember them both for a long time to come. In a motion picture, you will not soon forget. This is the picture Time Magazine calls the best British movie since Room at the Top. The New York Times calls it brilliant, so clarified and concentrated that it excites, delights, and hurts. And goes on to say, Albert Finney, a new sensation of the British stage and screen, is a very exceptional specimen. One of the most vigorous of recent pictures, says the New York Herald Tribune. A very exceptional film, a gem of the naturalistic style. You know the trouble with you? You don't know the Film, you really must see it, especially if you've only seen Albert Finney in Skyfall, um, looking a shadow of his former self. Um, he's absolutely fantastic in this movie. Melody's not here today, is she? Um, there's another fun fact about this movie, which is that one of my favourite bands, uh, the Arctic Monkeys, took the title for their first album, Whatever You Say I Am, That's What I'm Not, from a line of Albert Finney's in, that, in, this, in this film. And the Arctic Monkeys are certainly the, ninth, the, the sort of 2000 version of uh, The Angry Young Men, or at least they were um, uh, with that album. Okay, now let's get to the boring stuff, which is uh, a return to, um, uh, to, the, um, uh, uh, to people like me, the academics. Um, the remaking of class as a sort of cultural project doesn't just happen through films and, and novels. It happens in terms of the study, um, the, the emergence of new types of subdisciplines in the um, academy. New disciplines that come out in important ways shaped by the very people that are elevated out of the working class, by, if you like, the academic version of the, angry, of the literary angry young men. And it all begins um, in 1957 with the publication of Richard Hoggart's The Uses of Literacy that you can see um, uh, behind me. Hoggart's book is a, an account of the community and culture of his working class neighbourhood in Leeds um, in the um, 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and the corrosive influence on that community of, of course, you've guessed it, commercialised, Americanized um, mass culture. It's a very moving book, which is really a sort of nostalgic um, evocation of the sort of loss and mourning of that community and of his own position, of the relocation of his own position, because he was sent to a grammar school as a, as a scholarship boy before the war. And the last chapter of the book is actually about people like him who are educated out of their class. And it's, it's called Anxious and Uprooted. Just like angry young men, and Hoggart felt that these scholarship boys now belonged to no class. They couldn't return back to the traditional working class that they come from, and neither could they fully enter the world of the intellectual aristocracy that they um, were now surrounded by. It's not um, insignificant that the um, image on the front of this edition of the uses of literacy was um, uh, taken from the work of L.S. Lowry. Larry was an artist in the north of England who became very popular in the 1950s for his images of these so-called stick figures of people dwarfed in the old industrial landscapes of the northwest around factories um, and, and mills and warehouses. Um, this world was, of course, disappearing very fast in the 1950s and the 1960s, and as it was disappearing, Larry's work became increasingly popular. He was even offered a knighthood, which, to his great credit, um, he declined. Now, it wasn't just people like... Larry, um, like Hoggart, who um, received this new type of education out of their class. The expansion of the university system in the 1960s meant that, for the first time, you have, the, um, uh, the, you have members of the working class going to university in very small numbers. Um, and uh, these people very often become the leading intellectual figures in the formation of the new left in the 1960s and involved in the student protests and the student movements of the 1960s. They also go on to have a very important role in creating new subdisciplines, and I'm going to talk about two in particular. The first is cultural studies, and the other is social history itself. So, Richard Hoggart, after the great success of the uses of literacy, ends up setting, um, setting up at the University of Birmingham the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies, where he works in association with Stuart Hall. 
um, uh, the man who in the um, uh, 80s wrote um, New New Times in Marxism today, and is probably Britain's most preeminent sociologist to this, uh, to this day. Um, the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies did something that was unbelievably unique at that time. It basically gave birth to the discipline of cultural studies, um, and it took seriously the study of contemporary cultural life. That is to say, it sought to move away from the old left critique of commercialised culture and to try and take it seriously on its own terms and to understand its resonance and meaning and importance to um, uh, social life. Equally, a new discipline that emerges at this time is social history. Social history um, had been around for a while. Indeed, the first um, uh, position in social history was at my old, um, uh, at my old alma mater, the University of Manchester, in 1959. But in 1968, it sort of comes of, of age when Edward Thompson, probably Britain's most um, famous historian, along with Eric Hobsbawm to this day, formed the Centre for the Study of Social History at the University of Warwick. Now, just as the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies took seriously the culture of the working class, took seriously the study of popular culture, so social history tried to take seriously the social lives of working class people. But it also did more than that. It also, I would suggest, tried to recuperate, to, re, re, um, to, to, to reanimate an understanding of the centrality of class experience. Um, what these disciplines therefore tried to do was to focus upon recovering working class culture and working class history as a way of, of trying to energize the working class in the present by saying, look, here's your history, here's your history of activism, now we must regather and reshape and have a new era of working class activism in the present. The, the, the most definitive text in this regard was Edward Thompson's own book, The Making of English Working Class, in 19, uh, published in 1963. But this movement also spawns a whole series of other types of cultural projects. The History Workshop movement is formed in 1968 to try and um, engage in what it calls people's history. You know, very in the spirit of Harold Zinn, of trying to find, the, find what the people's history was, to provide a counterway to the traditional narratives of historical study through the study of ordinary um, people. And it was thought of to be a very democratic practice of history. It encouraged workers to do studies of their own, um, of their own families, of their own workplaces, um, and was a hugely important um, intellectual formation, which, as you'll find out next week, gives birth to the um, uh, new forms of feminism in Britain in, in the early um, 1970s. But it wasn't just within academic history, within academic disciplines that this stuff happened. There was also a revival of the folk movement, of the, the, the interest in folk songs and the performance of folk songs that was very much part of this. Um, the the um, uh, practice of oral history was a consequence of this, of this movement, of community publishing and community theatre, of people being able to, um, and of community arts, of people putting on their own, uh, publishing their own writing, putting on their own plays and, and their own artistic performance, all with the idea of trying to break down the old cultural hierarchies to say, look, the art and theatre and writing of ordinary people is just as important as, as those of the um, social elite. And of course, many of those forms of activity re-cemented the image of a traditional working class. Um, uh, so, for instance, um, there's a very famous book called The Classic Slum, published in 1971 by a man called Robert Roberts, um, which came out of the ad adult education program at the University of Manchester and looked back to his working class childhood in Salford, um, next to Manchester, in the early 20th century. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that all of these cultural projects look back to a traditional working class. And it's not at all unimportant that the traditional working class that they look back to was universally, uniformly, I should say, the white working class. Now, as much as there are all of these attempts to try and give voice to the working class experience and to emphasise the Englishness and the whiteness of that working class, that was, of course, created a whole set of people whose historical experience was effectively excluded from that script. So as class becomes increasingly visible and increasingly used as a way of trying to think about the past and the present by these intellectuals, so it generates a whole series of critiques against it. Feminists begin to take shape in Britain in arguing against the prevalence of class analysis and the way in which it neglects the position of women. Gay and lesbian politics similarly emerges um, in, as an, in part as an argument against um, the prevalence of class and, of course, equally critical, the emergence of black nationalism in Britain in the late 60s and early 1970s. Three key areas of social experience and of a new type of politics that this type of um, narrative completely uh, neglected. There's a final irony to all of this, which is that as new cultural ways of thinking about class became predominant, so class began to be understood as not grounded in a social and economic position, as not grounded even in any political ideology, but as being effectively formed by culture itself. That is to say, class became thought of as primarily a cultural category. And as it did so, it was something that people thought could be performed. I, it became, if you like, almost a, a, a stylized form of social performance. So the song that I began this class with, Pulp's Common People, is about this rich middle class woman wanting to sleep with common people, wanting to be part of the common people, and thinking that she could you know, wear the clothes and talk in the, in, uh, in the accent and, uh, and become you know, fashionably common. Okay? And the song is obviously about the impossibility or the absurdity of that, um, uh, of that image. The point is, is, basically, once class seems to disappear as a type of social and economic form of, of exclusion, it becomes almost fashionable to be working class. Any questions before I...